of the hilltop. Wow, uh, what a wonderful, wonderful promise we have from our Lord. And not only will we never more wonder, we will not have any more coronavirus, or will we have any media telling us how bad it is, okay? <laughs> and all those things to scare us and get us all worried and frustrated and all those kinds of things. It'll be a good day. But until that day, until that day we're here, and uh, we're here this morning at Sunlight Baptist Church. I'm glad you come. And uh, this is the Lord willing. This is it. This is the last time. This is we're finishing. We're finishing today with this drive-in and uh, that kind of thing and online Sunday night and all that. And by the way, for tonight, now this afternoon, you will get the uh, study sheet. If you're on the email list, you'll get the study sheet for the Bible lesson tonight. And I won't be late tonight. Fact is, I'm early. And uh, if you want to look at the YouTube channel, uh, you can do that. And it's already uploaded. And we'll switch it over to uh, the Sunlight Baptist Church Facebook page. I hope you'll enter into the, uh, the Bible study tonight on the book of Acts. Now, I like that, and I hope that uh, you'll enjoy it, be blessed, and be part of it. You have your bulletin there, and you have a psalm sheet there. You have an attendance card, and some of you uh, will want to put on the back of that any prayer request, and then turn it in as you go out. If you have an offering, you want to put it in an envelope and drop it in the bag as you drive out today, that will be fine also. But we have the song that is not on your song sheet. We made some changes this morning and then popped it up. So uh, Miss Abigail Reynolds is going to do it. And uh, she's adapted that just a little bit. I believe, go to David, the first song we're doing is at Calvary. The first song we're doing is at Calvary. You may know the words, you may not know the words. But you'll know the word as David sings it, and as it comes along in that period of time, and you'll hear the words, you'll say, oh yeah, I say, just enter into it, sing along, and there's nobody in there that's just folks that know you anyhow. Now, if you really want to sing out, you can roll your window down and just roll it in. All right. At Calvary, Brother David, come to us. God bless you. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. God's word is that my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty. And Oh, 
thank you so much. You have the uh, scripture reading there in your bulletin. If you'd like to turn to it. This is just after the resurrection. In fact, you're just a, a week after the resurrection. But uh, I want to share these verses with you. I'm going to preach from them after a while, the verses that you have there. I'm going to back up two verses from what you have in the bulletin. And I'm going to read uh, verse, starting with verse 24. By the way, don't you like the sunshine today? Now, I like rain every once in a while. But uh, it's good to see the sunshine. Somebody rent their life and say amen to that. <laughs> like the sunshine. Yeah, oh, okay. Well, that's good. Verse 24, John chapter 20. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was, with, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, when he came was on the day of the resurrection. Thomas wasn't there that day. The other disciples, verse 25, therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hand the print of the nail, and put my finger into the print of the nail, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, here you have verse 26. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen. Thank you, Lord, so much for this beautiful, beautiful day. Every day is a testament to your creative work, to your power. But days like this seem like they lift our spirits and cause us to look towards you, see the beauty around us, and appreciate you all the more. God, I pray as we have viewed these scriptures, as we ponder them, think about the great patience of our Lord Jesus Christ for one who struggled. Lord, yet you met the need of his heart. Lord, you encouraged us by reminding us that the blessing of having believed without having seen or touched or demanded uh, physical evidence, Lord, is a, is a blessing in its own. And thank you that we do have an abundance of evidence for the reality of your resurrection, and yet the greatest evidence is simply the work that you do in and among us. The truth of the scriptures testified again and again as we see it worked out in our lives and in our world. Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the declaration of who he is, as he came to this earth, incarnate God, Lord, not just to show who he was, but to bear my sin, to take our burden to Calvary and bear it alone. Lord, you've made a way. You've made a way to yourself through Jesus Christ, and we praise you for that. Father, this morning, as we sing, as we listen, as we engage in the word of God in a, manner of, a number of ways, Lord, whatever manner it may be, may it be with all our heart. May it be with our energy, with our effort, with our imagination, with our intellect, with everything that we have. May we enter into this this morning and leave, having known we've been together in a deep way, together with God's people, together with the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, all right. Amen. Amen. Listen to a couple of announcements. 
Things are going to change again. Okay? One thing is consistent. One thing that doesn't change is that we change. the announcements. No children's ministry, but everybody can come in the auditorium and uh, it'll be all right. You say, well, I don't know whether my kids will be good or not. 
It's okay. It's okay. We're family. We're family. We understand. All right? Well, let's just come on and enjoy each other and enjoy being together in the house of the Lord. Well, I think you'll know the next song. And you have it on your song too if you don't know all the words. So Brother Dave, come leave it with you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear how precious dear that grace of tears the hour I first believed in any danger toils and snares I have already David, I thought maybe I thought maybe we ought to have a contest next Sunday to see which car has the best singer. And uh, maybe we can just have each car that's here will have you come up next Sunday morning and sing a verse of amazing joy. Amen. <laughs> then see who does the best. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you one more chance. And let's sing that last verse again. When we've been there 10,000 years, can we change it? When we've been there forevermore, Amen. bright shining as the sun, sing it out, and if somebody in the car doesn't like the way you sing, just sing so loud you make them miserable, okay? Just make them miserable. Amen. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining can tell that you're going to be able to win next week because I can't even remember what he said for us to, to sing forever more. So let me get another book for you. song was given to me, uh, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, and, and was served by the fact of the words, and I want you to listen now to the words of, uh, of this song. You all know uh, this song, but, but don't listen to me sing it. Listen to
is cheating quite a bit. It comes through the airport, uh, you know, and it's not something that I'm afraid of asking. And we do this. And then uh, I'd like for us to be able to all get together. I see men in the, in the car. I'd like to see you in the basement. John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, the verses that we have read, we know that up until this time, the Lord has been preparing the disciples for his absence. He's not going to physically be with them 24 7 as he has been up until this time. And so he's telling them. Which is where we are today. Tom, 
was not present on that evening of the resurrection. Now, I don't know where he was. I don't know where he could possibly have been or why he was not in the church on that Sunday evening. But you always miss something when you're not in church. And he missed you that evening because he was not in church. I don't know whether he had duties at home. I don't know whether he wasn't feeling well. I don't know what the situation was. I just know he wasn't there. Somehow I wonder, now if you know Thomas, and you even hear a statement, some people are called Doubting Thomas. Because Thomas was always questioning things. And we don't have a lot of that throughout the scripture, but it seems like every time we see Thomas, he's questioning things. Why should this be? Why should that be? John chapter 14, he said, Lord said, I go away, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we all know the way. We don't know where you're going. We don't understand all that stuff. We know not where you're going. How can we possibly know the way? So he was a doubter. He wanted to see everything. He wanted to be able to touch, see, have the feelings. I'm sorry, Don. I've moved and I get over here to get back on the screen and people that are watching. I forgot that we're live streaming. I'll get back in place. You don't have to worry about it. I'll get back there and I'll stay there. Okay? I'll stay there. I'll be a good kid. I won't be moving around. Okay? I somehow wonder. I'm going to go ahead and read this. If Thomas didn't say, I'm through with it. I'm through with all of it. I mean, I pinned my hope on Jesus Christ. And now he's died. And it's all over with for me. And he just sort of gave up on it. He said, if it isn't going to work out the way I thought it was going to work out, I don't want any part of it. You guys can have it. You can stay here. You can hold up here in this room in Jerusalem if you want to. But I'm leaving. And then word starts coming that people have seen the Lord. And so he sees the other disciples and they tell him, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is very adamant about this thing. And he says, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And if I don't see him with my eyes, fact is, he said, if I don't see in, in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger in the print of the nails, and if I don't see where that spear went in his side, and if I don't put my hand in that place, I will not believe. Can you imagine the defiance of unbelief that is in a disciple, one who has walked with the Lord? For three and a half years he walked with him. And here is the defiance of unbelief. He says, unless it's done the way I want to do it, I will not believe. You say, well, that's terrible that Thomas would be like that. It is. But is it not terrible when we are like that? When we say, well, if God doesn't do this, if God doesn't do this, and if it isn't done this way, and if it isn't the way I want it to be, then I'm through with it. I won't believe. I won't believe. I'll have no part of it. The audacity of him to say, it's almost cruel what he says in his unbelief. Can you imagine a desire, a statement, not just to do it, but even to say it? without doing it, but to say, unless I put my finger in his hand. Can you imagine that kind of thing? I can't imagine looking at a, at a wound in someone's hand and 
saying, I'm going to put my finger in there. A piercing of the side, and he said, unless I, interesting word he used, unless I thrust. It's the same word that was used whenever the soldier pierced the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, unless I pierce this side with my hand, thrust my hand in his side. That's terrible. I can't imagine saying something like that. And yet, that is the statement of unbelief. And he said, unless I do that, I will not. I will not believe. You see, belief is always a matter of the will. People don't believe things because they do. I think there can be no illustration nor example given of this statement than what we've been through in the last month and a half, month, month and a half. People don't believe things because they're true. They believe them because they choose to believe them. People have preconceived ideas about things, and unless something fits their narrative, they don't believe it. You can tell somebody something about a friend of theirs, and they will say to you, I don't believe it. That guy's my friend. I know him. I don't believe that at all. I have friends. Someone were to come to me and tell me something about them, I would say to them straight up, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. That's my friend. I know him. I know how he thinks. I know how he acts. Now, my friend may have done or may have said what they told me, but I don't believe it. Now, if I'm given the proof, then perhaps I'll accept it. But I still don't want to believe it. For some reason, he says, I will not believe unless it fits my scenario. Unless it fits the way I want it to be. I won't believe. What does it take to make you believe? What does it take to make you exercise faith? May I say it like this? Who do you believe? Not just what do you believe, but who do you believe? The Word of God says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. And it simply means this. If everybody in the world disagrees with God and His book, everybody in the world is wrong. And the Word of God is to be believed. Thomas, a disciple, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ, did not live by faith. The Word of God says four times, once in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. But he said, I won't believe. He did not believe the testimony of ten of his friends. The other ten apostles, Judas, of course, is gone. There's eleven left. Thomas is there. Ten of them testify to him. We've seen the Lord. He's not dead anymore. He's risen from the dead. And he said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. It was a willful choice. And you make a willful choice about what you believe. You make a willful choice about what you believe whenever you hear the need. We tend to believe what we agree with. And those that say what we want to hear, we believe them. But we believe by choice. May God help us hear that. And not be like Tom. To have unreasonable demands in this. Define.
desiring God's will and wanting God to meet our standards of proof rather than us accepting what he said by faith. We say, if I don't understand it, I won't believe it. He said, if I don't see it, I won't believe it. Oh, I wish I could somehow communicate that person. Because Jesus is going to confirm it in just a few minutes, right there in that room, as eight days later on the next Sunday, they are together again. And Thomas is in the midst of them. And as the 11 of them are there together, and perhaps others you do not know, we know that on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 of them in that room. But at this time, we don't know how many are there, but at least the disciples are there. And I'm sure there were probably others. But they have testified to Thomas. Thomas is there with them now. And all of a sudden, Jesus is in the midst of them. And as he is in the midst of them, he says, Peace be unto you. Now they haven't seen him for a week. This is the first time in five years they've gone a week without seeing him. They missed that. about our duties on peace. And throughout the week, we just kind of put Jesus aside and out of mind until the next time we get together. How sad that is. That's not the way it's intended to be lived in this day. Jesus was trying to get them accustomed to living the way we live. The way he wanted them to live. To live with a constant consciousness of the indwelling Christ. Never think of yourself as a part from the Lord Jesus Christ. The next Sunday they are assembled. They're in the assembly. Uh, I don't know. There's a little song I like to sing. And I wish we knew it so we could sing it together next Sunday. But it says we're together again praising the Lord. We're together again in one accord. May the Savior add his blessing as his name we adore. We're together again praising the Lord. It's going to be good to get back together. I wish we could sing next Sunday. Maybe we could learn a little bit of it just try it. But here they are, eight days later on Sunday. They're together again. They're in the same room, in the same place. And sure enough, the same thing that happened last Sunday happens this Sunday. Jesus, all of a sudden, is there in the midst of them. Now, when he's there in the midst of them, they have not seen him. They have not communicated with him. It has been complete absence. Perhaps they've talked about it. Perhaps they've talked about what's going on, what's taking place. We don't understand it. Will we see him again? I don't know. But all of a sudden, there Jesus is in the midst. Peace. Peace be unto you. And then he turns directly to one individual in the congregation. And it's that individual that was absent last Sunday. And he looks right at Thomas. I think he must have called him by name. And he said, Thomas, Thomas, come here. Now the Lord's calling him out. The Lord ever called you out? Is the Lord calling you out now about this matter of trusting him? About this matter of believing him? about this matter of wanting God to meet your standards of truth. Uh, 
Thomas, come here. Come here, Thomas. Here's my hand. Behold my hand. Put your finger right here in the nail print. Oh, can you imagine how you would have felt publicly in front of everyone the Lord calling you out saying, okay, you want, you want to put your finger in the wound in my hand? Come on. Now, I don't think he was unkind. I don't think the Lord was unkind. I don't think he was like I would be. I will probably be. All right, big guy, come on up here. Let's see. Let's see what you want to do. Come on. Here, put your finger. Put your finger right there. Let's see you do this. I've probably been like that. I don't think the Lord was like that. I think the Lord was kind. I think he was gentle. But I don't think he was any of the less straightforward. He said, Thomas, come on here, put your finger on here. Thrust your hand into my side. I don't think Thomas did either one of them. But he knew something. He knew that one. That he said, I won't believe unless I do certain things, unless I see certain things. Thomas didn't come forward to put his finger in the wound. He didn't come forward to put his hand in the side. He came before the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fell before him. Without question, he worshipped. On his knees or on his face. And he confessed, My Lord, my God. Now whenever he confessed my Lord, what he confessed was you are the ruler. You are the Lord. You're the one who tells me what to do. You see, Thomas had said, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to see. This is the way I want it to be. And this is what's going to have to happen for me to believe. And now he says, no, no, you're the Lord. I'm not the Lord of you. You're the Lord of me. My Lord and my God. Can there be a more straightforward confession of the deity of Christ than whenever Thomas calls him my God and bows before him? Jesus does not refuse his worship. Jesus accepts his worship, and Jesus accepts the fact that he has called him God, and he does not refuse him for that at all. But he accepts his worship, and he recognizes his state, recognizes the state of the deity of Christ. That Jesus truly was. Jesus speaks of the attitude. Right here to Thomas. He says to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen, you believe. Now that's not the order throughout the word of God, the way God says it's to be. Even from the Old Testament, even David, uh, Abraham, the Old Testament prophets, they all operated on the principle. We believe to see. But Thomas turned that around. I want to see in order to believe. That's not the God order. The God order is to believe to see. David said, I have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the Lord. 
believe it, whether we see it or not. His word is enough. And when I see it in his book, it's enough for me. And Jesus said, Thomas, you have seen and you believe. And then he said, blessed are they. Remember that Jesus on uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Whenever he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the with the attitude. He called them the attitudes. Now, he gives another blessing to us. He says, Blessed are they who have not seen. You know who the Lord Jesus Christ blesses you? Who his blessing is upon? His blessing is upon you. If you believe. His blessing is on me. He's saying, blessed are you. Because you have not seen. I haven't seen the nail prints of his hands. I've read about it. I've heard the testimony from the word of God. I believe. this blessing that the Lord gives to those who have not seen and yet have believed. My physical eyes have never beheld the physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe him and in my spirit he testifies to me as much so or more so than if I were to see him with my physical eyes. I've not seen, but I believe. I don't have the testimony of a physical touch, but I have the spiritual reality of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Do you have that? Do you know that? Do you walk in that? Do you experience that? Is he real to you right now? Blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. Ron, I'm finding it very difficult to stay right here. But I'm watching this camera right here, making sure I stay in place. But what I want to do is I want to walk down on my knees. And I want to say, Do you believe? Do you trust Jesus? First of all, do you trust him as your Savior? Have you put your faith in him? Though you were not there when he died and you did not physically see him after his resurrection, you have the testimony of the word of God and you have believed it and you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you haven't, do that now. Do that today. Get in on this blessing that Jesus has pronounced. To those who believe without having to see. Now do you believe him in his will for your life? Do you believe him in this time of the media presentation of all the things bad that are happening and all the things that are going on and all that's going to happen to you and all that's going to take place. Now, I'm not saying their motives. I cannot judge their motives. But I do know this. That I don't trust a faith. I don't trust love. I think that's why at times that we have that. And I think that's good. And, you know, it's just wise to have good caution. Use the sense God gave you. Okay? But I don't trust those things for my health, for my care, for my provision. I believe God. 
I trust God. That doesn't mean I act foolishly. That doesn't mean that I act like I don't have the sense God gave me. It simply means I believe God. I drive down the highway down here, people come at me. Pass within two feet. Our bumpers pass within two feet of each other. Both of us go 50 miles an hour. Or more. And I trust that person knows what they're doing, knows how to drive a car, knows how to keep it under control. That they're paying attention and are not looking off and texting and, and talking on the phone and coming across the line and hitting me head on. I just, do I trust that? Well, yeah, but I trust the Lord. I trust His guidance. I trust His protection. I trust Him for security. I trust Him for safety. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Dearly beloved, don't be a promise. This instance right here changed Thomas forever, I think. We don't read any more about him in school. But he was there at Pentecost. We don't read about him in the book of Acts you'll hear me say tonight on the Bible study tonight it is believed that Thomas went to the east and the people in India I was there earlier this year in January before this whole thing started or was just as it started I was in India and the people there believed that Thomas with my spirit, I put my faith in you and I believe your word, that you love me, that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again, that you have the power and that you will forgive me and save me right now. And if you're here this morning, you've been living your life in fear, let that fear turn to faith. And believe him who loves you. And who designed you. Who has forgiven you if you trust in Christ Jesus. He's forgiven your sin. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And he has promised you. A home in heaven. Would you just take time right now to say, Lord, I do believe you. I do trust you. And help me every day to live in the light of your promise. Father, I thank you for the example of promise. I'm sure that in heaven now, Lord, that Thomas understands that even though we talk about it in some sort of negative way, he understands that his doubt has been turned into a good lesson to us to believe you. And I ask you, Lord, that you'll help every one of us, every day, in every way, to believe you, to trust you, 
pray you will go. Go in faith. And go faithful. We thank God for your being here.